Hello. So, in the comments on YouTube, somebody recently asked me if I might do a night flight in the Comanche, the Piper Comanche in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and to also demonstrate how ILS works in it. So, that's exactly what I'm going to do today. I am at Oxford Airport, or Oxford Kidlington Airport. This is the Pilot Plus version of Oxford Airport. So we're going to get the Comanche ready to do a flight from Oxford Kidlington and to fly it around the local area and do a little circuit and come back in. So if we go and have a look at little nav map and we'll just zoom out here. We can see where we are on the ground at Kidlington down here. And we are going to take off on runway 19, travel south, do a left standard rate turn, climb out and then fly level along parallel to the ILS beam and then turn back in. Now you're probably wondering what this line is that I've drawn. The reason I've done it is to give us a nice easy way to demonstrate how we can triangulate using NAV2 and NAV1 to figure out where we are at a glance. So we're going to tune NAV2 in to the Bovingdon VOR and put the Omni Bearing Selector to 300 degrees on it. We're going to tune NAV1 to the ILS frequency of 10835 and set its course to 191 degrees. Okay, this will all make a lot more sense when we actually do it and you'll be able to kind of tally the two things together and see what I'm talking about. Okay, so to cheat a little bit setting the aeroplane up because if I turn the power on we'll lose the torch and we'll be hunting around in the dark for switches. So I'm going to go to the controls in the tablet and I'm going to go to the cabin flood light front and turn it on or pre-switch it on if that makes sense so then if we just pop the yoke off for a second or we, we have to get rid of the tie between the the yokes first and then we can remove the yoke so we can see the switches that we're going to go and turn on down here so we turn the master power on and we have the floodlight straight away which is great so we can see what we're doing and see what we're talking about Okay, so we're not going to do the avionics yet, we've just got to get the engine up and running first so we can warm the engine up to tick over while we're sat here. So we'll just um, turn the switches to on, or the fuel shutoff valves I should say, to open. And then we want rich mixture. We've already got um, RPM on high for the propeller when it gets up and running. We'll crank the throttle open. We'll prime the engine. I always forget to prime it in this, this aircraft for some reason. So we'll give it three pumps. Two. Three. And then we can turn the magnetos to both. We'll go and turn the rotating beacon light on to warn people we're about to start the engine. Should we go and have a look at the outside? I've never actually watched it on this aircraft. So they've actually animated it, haven't they? That's really nice. So that just warns any people on the ground that we're about to start the engine. Okay. And we have an engine. So I'm just opening the throttle gently. And we'll hold it at a thousand RPM over here. Or just above, that's fine. So we'll let the engine warm up. I love the way the, the animates that in this aircraft. Okay, so now we need the avionics master switch on. And then we can go and turn the radios on. So there's nav 2. So you will notice I'm doing this purposely with the old instruments. So the, the most basic instruments on purpose. Okay, so we need to tune in. I've got state saving, so you can see where I had a little look at this earlier just to get um, used to the controls. What we're going to do is tune NAV1 in to the ILS, so 108.35. So you can see the active frequency on NAV1 is 108.35. So then if we go and look on the course here on NAV1, which is on the HSI in the cockpit, in the centre of the cockpit. So if I show you where that is, you've got NAV1 here and NAV2 over here. So NAV1, we want it on 190 degrees, which is the runway course, yes? 
So then nav 2, we're going to change the omni bearing selector, we've already done it, look, to 300 degrees. Makes sense? So we just line that back up, that's good. Oh, should we just go and sort out the um, fuel computer while we're here? There we go. We're not going to be using ADF today. I mean, we can turn it on if you want, but we're not actually going to use it. Okay. So engine's running, beacon light is on, let's go and turn on the landing lights to taxi with because we're going to need them and turn on the instrument lights and the, um, the, the lights on the end of the wings. Okay, put the yoke back on. Calibrate the altimeter. Now this is going to become important, so let, while this is just sat here warming up we're going to jump over to little nav map and have a bit of a talk. So, why have I drawn all these lines? We're going to take off runway 19. We're going to do a standard right left turn and then fly the reciprocal direction, so fly 10 degrees. But how are we going to know when we're at the appropriate point to turn back round to come in on the ILS? We're going to watch the CDI to line up on NAV 2, which will be at 300 degrees from Bovingdon. So we're going to keep going until we are 300 degrees from Bovingdon and then we'll execute another left turn and come back in. To come in at the right height for the ILS, if we have a look at this, the, um, the feathers on a typical ILS are 8 miles long, 8 nautical miles long. And they are, on this, in this case, they're 3 degrees. So this is the, a good one to stick in your head. A typical ILS feather being 8 miles long at the far end of it from the runway will be, or the glide slope will be 2,500 feet above airfield elevation. Yeah? So, bearing in mind that the airfield elevation here is 263 feet, so call that 300, we need to be at about 2,800 feet then when we come into the feathers to be in the right ballpark for the glide slope. Yeah? So we'll be at the right height. Okay, so we're going to put all of that together and go for a fly then. So, if we come off the parking brake and ease the throttle forwards... Nah, no, there's something else we need to do, put the parking brake back on. In this aircraft, we've done things a little bit out of step here, we haven't done the walk around. So we're going to need to go and remove the wheel chocks and the tie downs and the pitot covers. Okay, so then we can close that. Um, did we put the pitot heat on yet? Let's do it now. Because it'll be only... You typically don't put the pitot heat on until you're within a couple of minutes of takeoff at least. Otherwise you end up cooking the, the pitot tube. Um, so master switch is on. I'm just checking around what we've got switched on. Make sure everything's looking okay. Looks fine. Right. So parking brake off. So you shouldn't taxi any faster than walking pace in a GA aircraft. So the layout of Oxford's a bit odd. This You've got this looping taxiway that then joins runway 28, I believe, but we want runway 19 and it crisscrosses it. So at the intersection of 28 and 19, we are going to take off from that intersection. We're not going to use the whole of runway 19. It's like 5,000 feet long. We don't need anything like that for the Comanche. And because it's a nice long runway, we don't need flaps either for takeoff. We just need to get to about 80 knots to rotate. So if you remember what we were talking about, we need to get to about 2,800 feet. Ideally, to be at the right height when we make our turn back in to the ILS. So we'll be navigating by instruments to get into the right place in the sky. And we'll be able to look back on little nav map. Actually, there's two ways we can do this. Either we can use little nav map um, 
to see how well we've done, or, alternatively, we can turn our positioning off on Little Nav Map and go in, trust in our instruments, which I think is a great exercise to do sometimes. So, you know, without having the backup of GPS, just trust what the instruments are telling you, interpret what they're telling you, and go with them. So we're just going to line up. So this is wrong way 19 we're just pulling round onto. It may stutter a bit, it's loading assets at the airfield. Just straightening the plane up a little bit. Okay, you sit here at tick over for a moment. So what we're going to do then, you can see that's our route we took around the airfield along runway 29 and then on to the intersection. So we are going to go into Little Nav Map to stop ourselves from cheating. We are going to turn off the aircraft position. So all we have is the map to go by now. Okay. So is there anything else we need to do? I don't think there is. So open the throttle gently. Hold the centre line with a little bit of rudder. Just coming up to 80 knots and a bit of back pressure and we're in the air. Gear can come up. Looking for about 1,000 feet a minute for the climb out. Just keep the attitude where we want it. So we're looking for this 1500 feet. Look, we're accelerating really hard. So we can come back off the throttle already, really. We're not in a, this is not a race. We're not in a massive hurry. So if we look out, you can see Oxford over there. Let's make sure we don't turn. It's a very common optical illusion. People will look sideways and turn the way they're looking. There's actually a name for it in child development. I forget what the name of it is. Okay, so we're just climbing out. Did I? I did do the. Um, yeah, I did calibrate the altimeter. I thought I did. What well, something I didn't do though was calibrate the compass. I've just done that. So I've brought the HSI in line with the uh, the magnetic compass. So I pressed D to do that. So you can see I'm slightly off the course I should be on. It doesn't really matter too much. Okay, so we're just coming up to 2,000 feet. I'm going to bring the aircraft around now. So we've just effectively done a straight out departure, but now we're going to fly a reciprocal. So we're just doing a standard rate turn, so keeping the wing on the marker. Remember, we want to get to about 2,800 feet. So we can come off the RPM a bit as well. So we're coming round towards 10 degrees. So once we've got the aircraft stable, we can have a talk about what we're seeing on the instruments. So there's 10 degrees. Sorry for the sharp roll out there. And we're just trimming now to get the aircraft stable as we approach our cruise altitude. So I'm not going to use autopilot for this. I'm just going to fly it by hand. So we'll stop it climbing using the stick. And then we trim once we've moved the nose to where we want it and we use the trim to keep the nose where it is. And obviously referencing vertical speed at the same time. It doesn't need to be exact. Although if you talk to a military pilot they'll get chewed out over being 50 feet off where they should be. Okay so we are basically flying the course we wanted to which was 10 degrees. We're more or less at the height we want to be at, so 2,800 feet. 
Now, if you go and look at Nav2, you can see the course deviation indicator is showing we're off to the left of the line. So if I just get this lined up so we can look away for a moment. So we're off to the left of the line, the 300 degree line from Bovingdon, so we're somewhere here. And we, we know we're somewhere there because we are traveling, we did a left turn and we're traveling this way, so we are to the left of the line. It's worth having a look around actually. So that's Bista over there, it's Bicester, it's spelled, it's actually pronounced Bista. And that will be Banbury. As we're approaching Banbury, you will notice from the map if we go and look at it. So there's Banbury. So as we get fairly close to Banbury, you'll see this CDI sweep in. So you can see at the moment, Nav 1 is showing the ILS. Yeah? So at the moment we are above the glide slope. As we get further away, remember the further away we get, there's an invisible line in the sky that's climbing and climbing at 3 degrees. So as we get further away, we'll pass through the height on the glide slope. So you'll see that marker slide up the gauge as we get further away. Also, it's saying we are to the right of the ILS line. And we know we are. We turned left out of here. We are to the right of the line. When this all spins around, it will make a lot more sense. So we've climbed while we've been busy talking look, to 3,200, nearly 3,300 feet. So I'm going to come back off the throttle a little bit and descend down. So just 1,000 feet a minute will do it. Come back down to 2,800 feet. So, can you see the CDI is coming in on Nav2? So when that lines up in the middle, if we're still on our 10 degree track... ...then we know we are at about the right distance. So there's 2800 feet, so we'll level out. We should also see around the same sort of time that this gets to the middle, the glide slope will sweep through. Because on a 3 degrees glide slope, at 8 miles out, we should be 2,500 feet above the runway. So if I come down a little bit, say to 2,700, we'll see that happen a little bit earlier. Here it comes, look, it's moving. So our maths works. Yeah, so by the time this gets to the middle, we'll probably find that's in the middle as well, and then we'll execute our left turn to come back in. For those saying that, I'm just dropped a hundred feet. Look, while we were talking about that, so okay. So that's coming into the middle. When it's in the middle, we know we are on the 300 degree line from Bovingdon. Yeah, which was on 11375. Just hold up course. We are now below the glide slope. Okay, it's because we're 100 feet lower than we wanted to be, but... So we'll just speed up a little bit. And we'll begin a standard rate turn again. And you'll notice now this is going to spin round the HSI, and we'll end up going the same direction as the runway. And the CDI will sweep in. We'll probably over, over um, pass over the, the centre line of the ILS. Yeah, it's coming in already, look. But we can always correct for that, we've got lots of time. The reason that's happened is probably because I haven't kept the course very well, or the wind has pushed us, or we're just going faster now than we were on the climb out. So obviously the turn is a bigger radius. Okay, so we're coming towards, you can see the runway, and you can see we're off to the right, and that is illustrated here, look we're off to the right of the centre line. So if we straighten up, the important thing to realise here is you don't have to keep turning towards the needle. You put yourself on an intercept course 
and you keep an eye on your positioning so I'm just putting the nose down a little bit just getting our, ourselves straightened up so we're on an intercept course you can see the CDI is coming in you can see actually the glide slope we're almost on it already so then we turn in to try and anticipate the turn right we're going to go slightly off to the left I will admit I'm doing this a little bit lazily on purpose so you get to see it so we're a little bit off yeah so at the moment we're off to the left of the center line if we look up we're off to the left of the center line so I'm going to be bobbing up and down a little bit doing this so let's do it when we can see both because then you can correlate so we're going to go off to the right now and we are high we are above the glide slope so I'm going to cut the throttle back and dive or not dive but descend a little bit quicker we can go now, we're off to the right of the centre line. Yeah? And you can see that illustrated here. So at the moment we are above the glide slope, above where we should be. So I'm going to pull the throttle back. I'm going to use the wheels for some drag. And we'll go back across our track. To intercept it again we don't keep turning left we just do a few degrees bring the needle back in and straighten up so now you can see as well we are back on the glide slope now but also within range of using flaps so flaps to first position again the flaps will induce drag so if we go too low, so I'm letting the nose drop, watch the glide slope. You can see we've fallen below it. And you can also see the red pappy lights on the runway have all lit up all four red lights. If we put some more throttle in and climb, we'll climb above the glide slope. So we're now just going above it and you can see the pappy lights we've got two whites and two reds but nope they've all gone white now which means we're way above the glide slope so if we fall back down towards it so throttle off as we descend so we watch this instrument here and then we straighten up and you can see two reds two whites that's what you're aiming for Obviously we have visuals on the runway so we can actually use it in combination with the instruments and the lights and the attitude of the aircraft and you can just follow it in so you're looking at your airspeed, looking to lose speed as you come in as well. So we're going to full flaps now. You have to remember look that pushing in full flaps kicked us above the glide slope. So just correcting for that we're back on the glide slope obviously we don't have to see the wrong way to do this we could do this from down in here just looking at the instruments yeah it's not going to be a major problem so we've got the landing lights on we never turned them off so we should see them light the ground up very soon we're a bit low see that from the puppy lights there we go we're back on track So you're basically just following the needles on the, the nav instrument and the lights if you have them available on the runway. And then obviously once you've got visuals you can cut the throttle and flare the plane out for a nice clean, hopefully, landing. Flaps up. Just increase throttle gently to keep taxiing. It's quite a long taxi here at Oxford. So hopefully that showed you some of the basics. So you're using radios to triangulate sometimes. Depends what you've got available in the um, you know, in terms of facilities near you, in terms of VOR stations or ILS. You don't need distance measuring equipment. You can figure it out from your height. If you know that 8 miles is going to be 2,500 feet over the ground, 
you know then that four miles you should be at 1200 feet or if you are at 1200 feet and on the glide slope you're four miles out and so on and so forth you can work it both ways you only really need to worry about that if you can't see the runway yeah so you'll be watching your altitude and using it to work backwards to figure out your distance so as long as you're on the glide slope you can work out how far away you are where the real fun and games comes with radio navigation is if you, if you suspect or if any of the kit is that you know is broken so then your avenues for working out where you are become reduced and you have to start thinking a little bit creatively so let's go and turn off the strobes I never turn the strobes on. <laughs> it's a good job, really. Look how bright they are. Incredibly bright. So that's poor, poor airmanship from me that I didn't turn the strobe lights on during the flight. I should have done. On the, at the point we got to the runway, I should have had the strobes on. Let's go and find somewhere to park. I think park out on the end here somewhere. Oh actually no, let's go next to this airline and then go in next to the van. Okay, so parking brake on. Pull the mixture. Turn the lights out. Turn the beacon light off. Turn the pitot heat off. Turn the magnetos off. Turn the avionics master switch off. And I guess we ought to really turn this off before. So there's a switch up here that you can see it when it's on. But then obviously once it's gone we can hardly see even the master power switch. So what we have to do in that situation is open the tablet. <laughs> and then we can turn off the last few things. Our parking brake was on, sorry. So it's just the battery switch. Let me get the torch back. You can mo uh, map a, a button to the torch. So it's in the keyboard configuration. But yeah, hopefully you found that interesting. So that's just a, a quick flight around showing some of the principles of radio navigation and following the ILS in and showing you, you know some of the things you can you can use in your armory to get in so obviously it was really nice and easy for us today because we had clear visibility which made it very pretty outside but if it was really cloudy and we were being thrown around you can see the workload would go through the roof so it's really worth practicing I have got some other videos I've done in the past doing very poor weather um, circuits you know and approaches using instruments and it's I think it's great fun and it's a great exercise to do and again it's a simulator it doesn't matter if you crash a simulator it's all experience and you can learn from the lessons along the way okay I'm gonna leave it there I'll see you again soon